15 minutes. This is how long the president has to decide the fate of humanity. No matter if the U.S. president is in an airplane, taking a shower, or waking up from a dead sleep, this is the time limit on a decision to use U.S. nuclear weapons in the event of an attack. But how and why would the U.S. use nuclear weapons today? And what would a modern nuclear strike be like? When President Biden took office, he ordered a review of several governing documents that guide the U.S. defense policy, including the Nuclear Posture Review. Released in 2022, this document is the cornerstone of the current U.S. nuclear response. Though there is a lot of political fluff inside the document, several important parts define the current U.S. attitude towards nuclear war. One of the most important parts is that the U.S. does not limit itself to a no-first-use or sole-purpose policy. But what do these terms mean and what is their significance? A no-first-use policy is a political doctrine that states that no matter what happens, a nuclear state will only use nuclear weapons if attacked first by another country's nuclear weapon. This policy is considered the opposite of a first-strike policy meaning that if a nuclear-armed country believes a nuclear attack is imminent, that country could preemptively use nuclear weapons first before it gets hit. Because the U.S. does not have a no-first-use policy, the president has every option available, including a first-strike policy. I wonder, Mr. President, what you would say to him if he is considering using nuclear weapons. Don't. This means that the U.S. could be the first party to launch nuclear weapons in such a scenario. In addition to having a first-strike policy still on the table, the review also clearly states that the U.S. does not have a sole-purpose policy. Though academics and strategists differ on the definition of a sole-purpose policy, it is widely accepted that it is a policy that provides for the U.S. nuclear weapons in very narrow circumstances. These policies vary from administration to administration, but it could be something like the U.S. would only use nuclear weapons if the homeland itself was attacked or the U.S. would only attack specific targets. Though the policy is clear in that the U.S. will not deliberately target civilian targets, the official policy is that any policy is an option for the president to choose from without limitations. Additionally, the document makes it very clear that the use of any sized nuclear weapon anywhere of any yield would elicit a response from the U.S. That means the employment of even so-called tactical nuclear weapons would trigger retaliation from the U.S. If the president orders a nuclear strike, the commander-in-chief has numerous ways to carry out such a strike. This is because, like several other nuclear-armed states, the U.S. maintains what is called a nuclear triad. A nuclear triad is having the capability to deploy nuclear weapons from a land, air, or sea platform. But why is having this so important? Currently, the U.S. has just one land-based nuclear weapon, known as the Millennium-3 missile. There are currently 400 in service. These missiles sit silently in silos across the barren landscapes of Montana, Wyoming, and North Dakota. Inside these silos, crews stand watch 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, in case there ever came an order for a nuclear strike. But what is the Minuteman 3 and what can it do? The Minuteman 3 is the oldest serving nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal. First introduced in 1970, the missile is what's known as an ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. With a range of 13,000 kilometers, the Minuteman has the ability to hit almost any target in the world. However, these missiles face a host of maintenance issues and capability limitations under current U.S. treaty obligations. For example, the missiles were initially intended to have a service life of just 10 years, these missiles have now been standing watch for over 50 years due to several major midlife upgrades to each one. Because of this, the weapon is slated to be fully retired by 2036 when its eventual replacement, the ground-based strategic deterrent missile, is put into service. Besides challenges with maintenance upgrades, the lethality of the missiles has also been limited due to the most recent START treaty. 
Signed by the US and Russia in 2011, the treaty limited the number of warheads each country could deploy to 1,150, of which 700 could be ICBMs. This was a problem due to the Minuteman's multiple re-entry vehicles. In the world of nuclear arms, the gold standard is having a single missile that could fire multiple nuclear weapons. Known as multiple independent re-entry vehicles, each one had a nuclear warhead and each Minuteman III could carry three of them. Under President Obama, he decided to comply with the treaty to reduce the payload on each Minuteman missile to just one warhead. As a result, each missile was subsequently converted. However, during this conversion, each missile received a newer warhead that had a variable yield between 300 and 450 kilotons, depending on how large a blast was required. But while these missiles offer the advantage of distance, they are the least stealthy options and are the most likely ones to be attacked in a real nuclear war. So what other options are more flexible and less easily detected? Due to the missile silo's vulnerability to attack, the Air Force also maintains a robust aerial nuclear weapons program. Among the current and projected inventory of U.S. aircraft certified to carry nuclear weapons are the B-52, B-1, B-2, and B-21 bombers, along with the Air Force's version of the F-35 fighter. Why the U.S. maintains an aerial nuclear strike option is because the speed and stealth capabilities of the aircraft, minus the B-52, make them an ideal moving target that's hard to detect and even harder to shoot down. Among these platforms, the sole remaining nuclear bomb is the B-61. The B-61 was first introduced in the 1960s, and since then, over 3,000 of them have been made. In total, 12 different models have been manufactured, all with various yields and purposes. For example, there are around 500 or so active nuclear bombs in the Air Force's inventory. These bombs have different capabilities, from low yields of around 0.3 kilotons to strategic 350 kiloton weapons. In addition to having variable yields, some of them, like the Mod 11, are specially designed to take out certain targets. The Mod 11, of which about 50 are in service, is a ground-penetrating nuclear bomb meant to take out hardened enemy command posts and underground nuclear weapon facilities. Under President Biden's revision of the U.S. nuclear policy, he ordered the retirement of the much larger B-83 nuclear bomb. While the B-52 and B-2 have carried the bomb in the past, those warheads still active in the U.S. inventory are waiting to be dismantled. However, that is not the only nuclear weapon an Air Force plane can launch. Each U.S. heavy bomber can also carry the AGM-86B Airborne Launched Cruise Missile. Though this weapon also has conventional versions that have seen plenty of use in combat, the Nuclear One is the Bravo version, which serves as a long-range standoff weapon. This is because for planes like the B-52 to survive in a modern contested airspace, they need a weapon that can be fired beyond the effective range of enemy radar and air defenses. With a 2,500-kilometer range, the weapon gives even 60-year-old platforms like the B-52 a great chance at striking its target. In addition to the B-52, the Air Force has also conducted numerous tests with the F-35 to certify it to carry B-61 bombs. The Air Force is doing so because the Nuclear Positive Review specifically named China as a reason the Air Force needs to have it. If any F-35 could be nuclear-armed, it would be a great deterrent to conventional aggression. But despite the flexibility and range Air Force planes offer, they generally offer a more limited payload and face various ground-based and airborne threats. So what other option does the U.S. have to ensure greater payloads and survivability? The ultimate way that the United States ensures its capability to conduct a nuclear strike is through its fleet of 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. These submarines carry a massive payload, sporting two dozen Trident II missiles each. These submarines have the capability to fire nuclear weapons from anywhere in the world. With a combined total number of nearly 1,000 warheads, the Ohio-class submarine is the backbone of the U.S. nuclear force. But why? Because the submarine has a host of advanced stealth technology and its nuclear reactor, it can stay submerged for extended periods even when a nuclear Armageddon breaks out. 
Since Russia has no idea where these submarines are, they are the greatest deterrence to a nuclear strike, since they could be in Russia or China's back door without them ever finding out. With a series of midlife upgrades for the Trident II, it is expected to serve at least for another decade until the Columbia-class submarine comes online, and that will replace the Ohio-class. Once the Columbia-class enters service, the U.S. will maintain the edge as the world's greatest nuclear power for generations to come. And because of this, it is highly unlikely any enemy of the United States would dare to start a nuclear war. But if they did, what would the U.S. retaliation look like? If the U.S. decided to conduct a nuclear strike, it would go down like this. As soon as the president receives credible intelligence that an attack has happened or is about to happen, they would confer with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This group of generals and admirals are the leaders of the U.S. military, and their guidance would be sought about what to do. But despite their recommendations, the president is the only person whose permission is needed to launch a nuclear strike. After deciding this is the route to go, if the president is away from the White House, the nuclear football would be broken out. This device, frequently carried by a military aide, is actually a large, secure communication suite that allows the president to contact commanders of his nuclear forces. The president will actually pick the option for a nuclear strike from a predetermined menu of options, almost like ordering at a restaurant. When calling the responsible combatant commander, the president will positively identify himself using a code word from the biscuit. The biscuit is a physical note card carried by the president at all times, with call signs confirming the president's identity. Once the order is authenticated, it is then promulgated to the firing units. Whether it is a land, air, or sea-based unit, the firing unit retrieves a set of codes from its own safe that corresponds with the codes sent from higher headquarters to confirm the order's authenticity. Once the unit's senior officers confirm the order is genuine, the attack commences. Whether it's a missile leaving a silo or vertical launch cell or an aircraft taking off, the response would probably be one to eliminate the enemy country's military. Because current U.S. doctrine does not allow for massive bombing of civilian cities, it is likely that every major enemy unit in the field, every nuclear weapon site, and every command and control facility would be destroyed. In a real-world scenario, the U.S. would most certainly employ each part of its nuclear triad to ensure mission success. During the attack, the order of priority of targets would all be identified nuclear weapons facilities or sites, all command and control sites, and then major enemy formations of troops. The U.S. has stated that it wants to win a nuclear war by conducting as little damage as possible. Ordering a progressive series of strikes and evaluating their effectiveness in real time would be the most likely scenario. But is this very likely? Fortunately for America's enemies, a real-world strike is exceedingly unlikely. Even the first use of nuclear weapons is unlikely to elicit a reciprocal nuclear response in today's day and age. For example, it was widely believed amongst defense analysts that if Russia were to use nukes in Ukraine, the U.S. would instead respond through a massive conventional bombing campaign that would eliminate the Russian army in Ukraine as a fighting force. This is because the number of hybrid warfare options from long-range precision weapons, cyber warfare, and other non-conventional means is much greater today than ever before. As a result, it's highly unlikely the U.S. would ever use the full force of its nuclear arsenal if a nuclear attack on the homeland were imminent. But of course, it would always be wise if America's enemies never tried to test that theory in the first place. Bye for now.